Thank you. Good evening. We'd like to welcome you to the meeting of the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education. Happy to see so many visitors here this evening. We are doing some recognition, and but we'd also like to invite you to stay to the very end if you'd like. <laughs> Usually by the end, all these seats are empty. But Okay, so um, we are going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and this evening we are happy to have Ascension Solarzano Middle School Principal Maria Walker with some of her students who will lead us in the pledge. Um, again, good evening, board members and Dr. Flores and um, everybody in the audience. I have two of our ASB students who will lead us in the flag salute and they will introduce themselves. Come on up, sweetheart. Le lean in a little bit. I'm Isabella Rosal. And I'm Bailey Gooding. Okay, and who's going to sing? Sweetness. Please stand for the flag salute. Ready, begin. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and please be seated. Thank you, students. We appreciate you coming and leading us in the pledge. You want me to do it? Mm -hmm. Hay alguien aquí que necesite intérprete para esta junta? Thank you, Lucy. Okay. Uh, item B, 4B, we will have the approval of the agenda. This is an action item. I will entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. And now we're on item 4C, which is the recognitions this evening. We have a number of recognitions this evening. I'm very pleased to uh, be able to tell you about these special students and staff who are going to be recognized this evening. So I'll start with the GECA uh, students who are semi-finalists with the National Merit Scholarship Award program. And so this evening we're going to recognize two seniors and I'll ask them to come up, Maoli Bedoni and Sanaya Lakadawala. I, I know I'm not saying your names right, so <laughs> come on up. <laughs> you want to say them correctly? <laughs> or can you live with that? <laughs> Good. Okay. Anyway, we're really proud of these two students. They were named as semifinalists for their outstanding performance on the preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. We all call that the PSAT MSQT. And this was administered nationwide in October 2016, and there were 1. million students that participated. So keep that number in mind. That is a lot of students. To become a finalist, the semifinalist in his or her high school must submit a detailed scholarship application in which they provide information about the semifinalist's academic record, participation in school and community activities, demonstrated leadership abilities, employment, and honors and awards that they've received. A semifinalist must have an outstanding academic record throughout high school, be endorsed and recommended by a high school official, write an essay, and earn SAT scores that confirm the student's earlier performance on the qualifying test. And they represent less than 1% of U.S. high school seniors. Just think about these. These two students are in that group, that is an amazing category to be in as a high school student, and we're very proud of both of you. So now they're part of 16,000 semi-finalists who are competing for over 7,500 scholarships that are worth 32 million. So divide that, 7,500 into 32 million, that's still a lot of money. So in the spring of 2018, winners of the National Merit Scholarship Program will be announced, and Drum roll. <laughs> we hope there are two of them. 
So we're very proud of both of you, and we have a couple of certificates, and we hope to see you again after May. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize two other GECA uh, students, Abigail Ung and Erin Nguyen. The, would the two of you please come up? And I'm probably massacred your names too. <laughs> oh, good, great. <laughs> and they were also recognized by the National Merit Scholarship Program as commended students for their outstanding performance on the test. They are part of the 34,000 students who throughout the nation received a letter of combination for exceptional academic progress. They place among the top 50,000 scorers. And remember the number I started with, 1.6 million? That's still pretty amazing. So we are very proud of both of you for your wonderful accomplishment and for representing our district so well. All four of you, we're very proud of you. So congratulations. And we have a certificate for each of you. Great. Thank you. And I'm sure their parents are in the audience, so we want to uh, commend you also. Because when students reach this high level of uh, performance, that we know that there's been a support network there their entire lives. So mm -hmm. congratulations to you also. Thank you. All right, we're going to recognize a couple of uh, staff. So as I alluded to earlier, Patricia Mondragon uh, was selected for two awards from community agencies. So Patricia, you want to come up? And I'll... I'll talk to you about both of the awards that she uh, has already received. We're very proud of her. So first she's been um, recognized by the Youth Alliance, who's one of our partners, I think you know, and received the Change Maker Award. And Youth Alliance strives to create thriving and equitable communities through, through comprehensive, innovative, and culturally rele relevant services that equip youth and families to become change agents in their own lives. Each year, Youth Alliance recognizes members of the community who support their mission by empowering and enriching the lives of families and youth. And Patricia has exhibited many of the qualities that they expect to see in the person they select for this award. So she's filled many roles in our district. I, I, I think you all know this, but you may not know some of this. She, in her past, was a home-based migrant education teacher in the summertime. She was an exceptional DI teacher at Los Animas and then kind of urged to go over to uh, South Valley and taught there also in the DI program, did a great job. Then she was assistant principal and now principal. This is her second year. And she even worked in adult ed. I didn't know that way back when. So, um, And she was a, a student um, in adult ed at one point. She's, she has a really incredible personal story that um, really fits so well with what she's doing now and making a difference in our community and at South Valley. And as I mentioned, she's second year. And since arriving at South Valley, she's strived to bring new opportunities, not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom. So now there's a coding club, a science-oriented makerspace club, a mariachi and ballet folklorica club. And as she mentioned earlier in her presentation, there are many wonderful things happening at South Valley, but just to single out, the Harvest and May Fest, which as you mentioned, I think you said 600 individuals attended the Harvest Fest. That's great. So um, this award, as, uh, as I mentioned before, is an award that's given every year by Youth Alliance. And it's a testament to all the wonderful things that she's doing at South Valley. So we want to congratulate you first for the Change Maker Award from Youth Alliance. Oops, 
So we have a plaque for you, too. Um, so I'll read the first. Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education proudly recognizes Patricia Mondragon, recipient of the Youth Alliance Changemaker Award. Thank you for your commitment to improving the lives of students, families, and the community. Your dedication to providing positive change empowers our future generation of youth to achieve and succeed. Presented this fifth day of October 2017. So congratulations. That way. <laughs> okay, great. Patricia also uh, is being rec was recognized recently by Claras, our um, community agency for resources agency, as a community champion, and they do this annually. So we have the pleasure again of honoring um, Patricia, and I, I understand this was a, a picture of the award ceremony, yeah. is that correct? Mm -hmm. I was not able to attend that. We had a conflict in the district, but that's great. And I, what I heard was that the award ceremony, the student that you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. uh, made some comments, and they were so special, we, we actually wanted to share those with the board. So um, one of her students, Edwin Lopez, who's kind of in the center there next to Edwin, um, he, he received the Community Champion Youth Award that night and uh, at the same time that Patricia received hers and he presented the award to her which I thought was very special and this is something he said, this award goes to a woman who really inspires everyone, not only me but the whole community. She is one of the best teachers I've ever had. I mean, that must have brought tears to your eyes, <laughs> that was quite special. But what, um, what the agency shared with us is Patricia has worked hard to positively impact students and families. She encourages students to embrace their culture and seek opportunities and experiences they would not normally have. She also supports the many types of services that are offered to her students that are often provided by school link services. So Patricia, we're really proud of you again for receiving a second award. <laughs> and we'll give you that one now, and so this one says, Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education proudly recognizes Patricia Mondragon, recipient of the Community Agency for Resources Advocacy and Services Community Champion Award. Thank you for being a supportive leader of students, families, and the community. Your advocacy, guidance, and inspiration motivate students to continue their educational journey while realizing their goals and dreams presented this fifth day of October 2017. So congratulations again. Thanks to her counselors and assistant principal for being here for this ceremony. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much to my academic counselors. Last year was um, awesome to, to have you right next to me, so I was able to do so much because of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. As you know, on an annual basis, each district is asked to uh, identify their teacher of the year, and then all uh, 31 teachers from all districts are recognized at an event. And on September 14th, many of us were proud to be in attendance at the 48th annual 2017 Santa Clara County Teacher of the Year Award ceremony. And um, at that ceremony, our teacher of the year was recognized, Kathy Silva. So I'm going to like ask Kathy to come up right now and embarrass her again. Of course, <laughs> at that event, I think there were more like, what, a thousand or more people? There was a lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> it was held at the uh, Heritage Th Theater in Campbell, and it was packed. There was standing room only. A lot of people, so lot of people were there. But it was quite, uh, quite an, uh, a ceremony, and we were really pleased, many of us, to be there to support 
a great teacher. So anyway, the county office, as I mentioned, recognized 31 teachers that night, and they're selected for four categories, skill and cre creativity in the classroom, leadership and communication skills, involvement in professional development, and commitment to student school in the community. Those certainly fit Kathy Silva. Kathy began her employment with the district 18 years ago. She had been in another career as a software engineer before coming into education, and that was a great day for our district because she came in as a math teacher, and uh, over those 18 years, she filled so many different positions and ended, of course, as a math department chair and was a teacher leader, teacher coach, outstanding math teacher, and I'm wearing two hats when I say that because my son had her as a teacher and loved her and showed up for a short while that <laughs> night and never does that, by the way. <laughs> never goes to any kind of celebration like that. So, And she's, she's worn a lot of hats, WASP coordinator, and also a really important hat that she and her husband continue to wear today is cross-country coach and uh, I hope Oh yeah. <laughs> track and field coach next spring. <laughs> I know you're in cross country yeah. right now, but I hope you're coming back for oh. track and field. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> but anyway, um, they did that for many years, and I, I credit um, in my, in my own experience, my son's smooth transition to ninth grade because of their uh, involvement in his life. It was pretty amazing. But anyway, she's an amazing teacher who retired last June, but again, is already coaching for us in retirement, and I see her at other things, so I, I guess it's hard to leave after <laughs> being so involved. <laughs> uh, we had this really long description that went to the, to the county with her nomination, so I'm, I'll just single out uh, some of the things that were said about her. Kathy Silva is a get it done and then some type of teacher. She is a second career teacher who joined Gilroy High in 1999 after a career as a software engineer. She was a site WAS coordinator, department chair, mentor, teacher, and a track and field cross country coach. She made a tremendous impact on the campus. She volunteered her time selfishly, including at the district wide run for fitness event involving hundreds of elementary and middle school students. She was an exemplary teacher in the classroom and outside and held several leadership roles. Under her leadership, Gilroy High was able to transition to the new Common Core Math Standards. Her collaborative work with our sister high school and successful partnership with the Santa Clara County Office of Ed Professional Development made that, made that transition possible. She was a well-respected, as a well-respected, and held a very high regard uh, teacher still to this day. And her classroom walls, I used to love this when you walk in, were adorned with senior portraits of some of her former students who often stop by and visit uh, because she just had such a great influence. And she has a great big smile. I'm sure you've noticed that they used to love uh, when they were in her classrooms. And, and we will always be grateful for your 18 years and that you decided to leave the software engineer business to come and teach kids and, and have a lifetime impact on them. So thank you, Kathy. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And I'm back. <laughs> and we have a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education proudly recognizes Catherine Silva recipient of the 2017 Santa Clara County Teacher of the Year Award. In recognition of your dedication, commitment, and inspiration to students, families, and the community, with sincere appreciation for your contributions as an exemplary teacher who has demonstrated such amazing encouragement, passion, and caring for those whose lives you've touched in so many ways, presented this fifth day of October 2017. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I know there's a, I wanted to mention that Marco is at a CIF, I forgot the committee, a top level CIF meeting today, so he couldn't be here this evening, but 
Liz is here, assistant principal, and a couple of teachers from the school. We really appreciate you coming out and recognizing Kathy. Thanks. Thank you. Right, thank you. And you don't have to stay. <laughs> The next item is Resolution 171810, recognizing October 9th through the 13th, 2017, as Week of the School Administrator. Is there anything? I, don't, I don't know if anyone wants to read it. I will if no one else wants to. I'd be I happy. I don't to. have it. Yeah, I don't think we have it. Let me find it real quick. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Is it the one that starts in observance of? Yeah. So I'd like to just uh, make a few comments. Each year, uh, we recognize teachers in March and classified staff, I believe, shortly after that. So there's a week where we designate uh, as Teacher Appreciation Week, Classified Employee Week. The um, uh, resolution for school administration is always in the fall. So I just wanted the public to know that we recognize all of our employee organizations, but. The administrators are recognized in the fall. And I want to say my sincere thanks and appreciation for all of our administrators and the great job they do on a daily basis. Sometimes it feels like a thankless job, I'm sure, because you work so hard and you're there all hours of day and night. And um, I'm just really proud of our administrative team. I think we have a great administrative team We've been kind of building this team for a while now, and I think some of our new hires this year really complete the team, so to speak, and I'm very proud of our administrative team and all of their efforts on behalf of our staff, our students, our community, and I would stack up this team against any other team out there. So thank you so much for all of your efforts, and I'll be happy to read our resolution into the record. Got to swallow first. I've been talking for 10 minutes. Okay. Whereas leadership is a critical component of California's public education system and the more than 6 million students it serves, and whereas school administrators are passionate, lifelong learner learners who believe in the value of quality public education, and whereas the title school administrator is a broad term used to define many leadership posts, including superintendents, assistant superintendents, principals, assistant principals, special education and adult education leaders, curriculum and assessment leaders, school business leaders, classified educational leaders, and other school district employees. And whereas providing quality service for student success is paramount for the profession, and whereas most school administrators began their careers as teachers, with the, average with the average administrator has served in public education for more than a decade, and whereas such experience is beneficial in their work to effectively and efficiently lead public education and improve student achieve achievement, and whereas public schools operate with lean management systems, employing fewer managers and supervisors than most public and private sector industries, including transportation, food service, manufacturing, utilities, construction, publishing, and public administration. And whereas school leaders depend on a network of support from school communities, fellow administrators, teachers, parents, students, businesses, community members, board trustees, colleges and universities, community and faith-based organizations, elected officials and district and county staff and resources to promote ongoing student achievement and school success. And whereas research shows great schools are led by great principals and great districts are led by great superintendents, I did not write that. <laughs> and whereas these site leaders are supported by extensive administrative networks throughout the state, 
And whereas the state of California has declared the second full week of October as the week of the school administrator in Education Code 44015.1, and whereas the future of California's public education system depends upon the quality of its leadership. Now therefore be it resolved by the Gilroy Unified Board of Education that all school leaders be commended for the contributions they make to successful student achievement. Thank you. And this is an action item. Roll call. Move for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. And this is a roll call vote. Heather Bass. Yes. B.C. Doyle. Yes. Mark Good. Yes. Pat McCarthy. Yes. James Pace. Yes. Linda Paceno. Yes. Jaime Rosso. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Thank to you all. all the yes. administrators. Thank you to the, all the administrators that are in the room. And we, we do understand the value of leadership, and we do appreciate what you're doing at the sites every day. Thank you so much. Uh, general public comment, do we have any? Okay. And item E is report of action taken in closed session, and we have nothing to report today. Uh, reports to the board. We have student board representatives from each of our high schools. And tonight we have Daisy Zarada Osorio, who is representing Dr. T.J. Owens Gilroy Early College Academy. And welcome, Daisy. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daisy Zarate. Um, I'm going to be reporting on Gilroy Early College Academy as well as South Valley Middle School. So looking back at August, we had our UC Berkeley field trip, as well as our first day of college classes, our beginning of the year awards assembly, and our spirit week. The UC Berkeley field trip took place August 11th, and it was really fun. The students got to um, get a tour of the campus, as well as tips on making college life easier. And the Tudor's campus tour our Agriprep tutors gave the freshmen a tour of the Gavlin campus um, prior to the beginning of college classes on August 28th. And this was just to um, get the freshmen kind of like situated and more comfortable going to and from their college classes. The beginning of the year awards assembly was held August 18th. And here we had awards given to students in grades 10 to 12. We also went over school rules as well as introducing our associate student body. Spirit week, we had our spirit week August 21st through August 25th. We had Mix It Up Monday, Twin Tuesday, Workout Wednesday, Throwback Thursday, and Phantom Friday. In September, we had our ninth grade elections, game days, club day, uh, or PTSA potluck for freshmen, and back to school night. On September 1st, um, we had our ninth grade elections, and they were really entertaining. The freshmen had a lot of creative campaigns. Um, our elected officers were from left to right. Um, Patrick DiCastro as president, and Ephraim Ong as vice president, Kelly Ramirez as secretary, and Jack Fan as our treasurer. On September 8th, PTSA held a potluck for our freshmen, and it was to welcome them to um, our school, and that was really nice, so a huge thanks to them. Game days and club day, we held our game day September 11th through September 15th. Um, we had three days where um, we had volleyball games during lunch, and the teachers actually got to participate in that, and that was really amusing to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on the 14th, we also had our obstacle course, and on the same day, we also had club day, where clubs such as Interact Club and Ignite Club came out to um, get new members. And on Friday, we had Mario Kart during lunch, and that was also really fun to watch, really, really fun. On September 12th, we had our back-to-school night, 
and this is where parents basically got to go through their kids' high school schedule, and we had some ASB members there to help guide them from class to class. And what we're looking for in October, um, we're looking towards our Mental Health Awareness Assembly, which is actually tomorrow. And we have our game day fundraiser coming up, as well as ASB going to their middle school visits. We also have our PSAT and our Halloween dance. So that's exciting. And on to South Valley Middle School. A general overview of what they've been up to. They've had their first day of school. They've gone, they, they've had their back to school night their spirit assembly, and their harvest festival is coming up. The first day of school and back to school night. The first day of school um, for them was August 17th, and in the words of Ms. Mandrigal, uh, the students were dressed to impress, and they were also very excited to come back and meet their friends. Um, back to school night was August 24th, and here parents basically basically got to meet their um, meet the students' teachers as well as get a general a feel as the um, as to what the atmosphere their students would be learning in, and the spirit assembly, South Valley had it on the on September twenty second, and basically they had a lot of events held by their ASB students, and with the help of Mr. Wickham, I'd also like to note that this whole that whole week was um, a spirit week, and they had days such as sports day and superhero day. And finally, October 27th, they're gonna have their Harvest Festival and it's a huge fundraiser with over 500 community members coming and all clubs are represented, so go support South Valley. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daisy. Next we have the superintendent's report. As you know, um, I've been visiting elementary schools, and so it, since our last board meeting visited Luigi Aprea, Gilroy Prep, Glenview, and Rucker, and I did not write down which boards. I know uh, Mark Good came with me on Gil Gilroy Prep. Did anybody come on the other three? I can't I went remember. You went, Lu Luigi. Mm -hmm. So um, two board members accompanied me. I'm used at Gilroy Prep as well. Well, good. Thank you. You know what I need to do? I need to tell Gina the minute I walk him into the office, guess who went with me on, a, on the site visit today? Because two weeks later, I can't remember. But anyway, very good site visits. And I, 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 what I walked away with after visiting four elementary schools in two weeks is the high level of implementation of our new uh, benchmark curriculum. I was really impressed. I saw it everywhere. And generally, I was hearing positive comments from teachers. I was hearing things we expected, uh, like in the primary grades, that we need to supplement it a bit. But I really felt that most of the comments were very positive about the uh, curriculum, and we were seeing it everywhere. And so that was very exciting. Go math isn't even a topic of discussion now. It's just people are using it. They're very comfortable with it. And, um, and I'm, I'm expecting good results with these two adoptions. I think we're going to see a lot of improvement this year on our, our, our CAF scores. Um, I, we had our monthly meeting with the Gavilan. Um, I had my monthly meeting with the Gavilan president and city administrator. And those are always really good meetings because we do have uh, topics of interest between us. So for instance, Sonia is still here this month's topic was about uh, SROs. And uh, with the city, of course, it was about development and the bridge and things that you heard at our special meeting, which was held on September 25th between the, the city council and the school board. So those are really productive meetings because it gives the three of us a chance to really drill down and talk about the issues in a way that you can't do when you have 14 public officials sitting there. So they're very productive. Not to say that my, those meetings aren't, but um, then we are at our joint meeting, I thought we discussed a lot of, we had some really big topics this year or this quarter with the city council um, and learned some information we didn't know, like the 10th, 10th Street Bridge has been put on hold if it's going to be a built at all. 
and we talked about Alexander Station and other topics of interest. On Monday night, I was very excited to be able to attend the Gilroy High Fall Choral Concert called Perspectives, and I know Mr. Pace and his family were there um, because his daughter was performing. I have to tell you, the acoustics is better than I thought oh, it good. would be. Oh, it was wonderful. I mean, it's just night and day. That's the best way I can describe it. Is it perfect? No, because it's still a cafeteria, but it is dramatically improved. So all of the uh, treatments are done, so you have to go see it to see everything that's been done, but it worked. And maybe, and we're gonna have the acoustician come back and see if he thinks we can do anything more to tweak it, but it's just so much better. You can hear the person next to you talking. You can hear the speaker at the front talking. Mm -hmm. You, you could hear them before, but you didn't know what they were saying. Yes, I was just going to so say, jumbled. Now, do you know what but they now mean? you can understand them. You can hear all the voices in the choir. It projects well, almost as well as, as a, a big church. Not quite as, as good, because again, it's a cafeteria, but the sound is dramatically improved. And this isn't just for performances. As I sat there, I was thinking, now we have a great place for professional development. You know, we can make that into any size of room we want. We can have 200 people or we can have 500 people. So it's really amazing, actually, what was done in the, uh, in the Gilroy High Student Center. And now we have a facility that we can use for up to 1,200 people. We, I don't think we'd ever want to put that many people in the room, but... Uh, the community can use it. And the community it. can use it. And it's a really acoustically sound place now to, to use. So we're very proud of that. On Wednesday, I was able to participate in this year, Los Animas' International Walk and Bike to School Day on Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock. A bunch of us were out there almost in the dark and very cold, 42 degrees. But we had a lot of um, students and parents out there uh, walking and biking. We walked probably about, I don't know, half a mile um, over to the school. And then uh, Roland Velasco, our, our mayor met us there and handed out goodies that he brought, and then Pat Metgard joined us, and we had an assembly, and each of us spoke about the importance of walking and uh, riding to school. Now, lots of parent participation, as you can imagine. Very well done. And the two count well, there were two counselors there from Solarsano that really helped organize the event, and I wanted to commend them for their help. And mention that next Wednesday is Solar Sanos, and I can't go because of a superintendent's meeting. It'd be great if some board members could participate in their uh, walk ride to school. We have to, we're down to two back to school nights. We only have a couple left. Those are Mount Madonna and Advanced Path, but we have a bunch of events coming up. So this Friday on uh, Friday afternoon, I'll be driving to Burlingame to speak to the Access Superintendents Academy. I guess there's about 40 uh, people thinking about su being superintendents, and I promise not to talk them out of it. <laughs> I will encourage them to consider it, but I get to speak to them along with some other superintendents. And then I'm going to rush back, I hope. I'm praying for good traffic because it's the big Christopher High, Gilroy High football game Friday night at Christopher High this year, and I'd really like to be there uh, for at least half the game, so I'm hopeful that traffic will let up by the time I leave Burlingame. Um, on October 14th, there's the Power School Carry the Vision Meditation Training, where uh, a full day of training on uh, meditation, which is being used through, throughout our district. Um, I will, on the 14th, that same day in the late afternoon, is the Garlic City Classic Marching Band Show, which is just a great show if you haven't been Marching bands come from all over the state, and some of the best perform. It's an incredible event. I love it. I go to it every year. So I hope some of you can go. It usually it says 4.30. I think the first band comes on around 5, and they start with the smaller bands, and by the end of the night, there's 300 student bands performing. So it's a pretty amazing event. And then we do have our fall band concerts here, and you can see those up there on the screen. Christopher and Gilroy both have their band concerts coming up in October. So a lot of really good events to attend in October. 
And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have the consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion to approve it. Move approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, <clears throat> item 7 is 7A is a public hearing for compliance with Education Code Section 60119 Pupil Textbook and Instructional Materials Incentive Program for grades TK through 12. Thanks, Sonia. So do you want to call the public hearing to order? Mm -hmm. Public hearing will now come to order. We have Deb Padilla presenting. Kathleen or Beerman. Kathleen Beerman. <laughs> and I don't believe we have any public comment on this item. So, no, so okay. we're good. If there's no comment, then we'll close the public hearing. Public hearing is closed. You could, could say a few words about our process this year because I, I think the board might be interested in that. Yes. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, we um, worked diligently this year to ensure that um, everyone clearly understood what material, instructional materials uh, were needed for all of our classrooms, uh, TK through 12. And so we actually have a binder where all the uh, elementary teachers signed off about their sufficiency forms and all department chairs at the secondary level signed off on that. Um, but the good news is, um, you know, with our new adoptions, again, uh, adjusting numbers, more students in one grade, not in the other, we ordered additional materials, got everything in place for all of our students, um, including our special education students. Um, so all is good. <laughs> and now we're in the process of implementing. And if you want to see, I mean, they offered to put, I don't know, 500 pages of documents <laughs> on the agenda, but Linda, Pat, and I didn't think that you would really want that. But if you wanted to see all the certifications, we have them. <laughs> Actually, a, a very important item because it's our responsibility to make sure that our students have the materials they need in order to learn and the teachers have the materials they need in order to teach. So this is a resolution. It's resolution 1718-09, sufficiency of textbooks or instructional <coughs> materials. Do you want me to read it or have you had a chance to do this? Board I don't members. think you need to read it. Pardon? I don't think you need to read it. Okay. It's in our binders. All right. So we'll have a roll call vote on this. Do we need a I motion? Move approval. Motion. I didn't get a motion. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call vote. Heather Bass. Yes. B.C. Doyle. Yes. Mark Good. Yes. Pat Midgard. Yes. James Pace. Yes. Linda Caseno. Yes. Jaime Rosso. Yes. So it moves approval unanimously. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The okay, next item is 8A, California School Employees Association, CSEA Chapter 69, initial proposal for the 2017-18 school year. This is an action item. So Jim Fletcher is here I, to speak on behalf of the CSEA. Thank you, Jim, for coming. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you noticed I'm not Leanne. <laughs> um, the last few years, the negotiation process has... Uh, been super productive and really enjoyable um, and you know I expect nothing different this year I think it's going to be smooth sailing and quickly resolved and we look forward to engaging and starting the process thank you great this is an action item this is the we you will be approving or disapproving the initial bargaining proposal for the 2017-18 school year move to approve second it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? This passes unanimously. Thank you, Jim. Item 8B is the traffic impact analysis for the new elementary school project. This is an information item. And Alvaro Mesa, Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, will introduce the item for board discussion. 
Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, Board. Good evening, Superintendent, members of the public. Tonight, we have our traffic consultant from Hexagon Transportation, Mrs. Gisela uh, Del Rio, is here tonight to provide an overview of the traffic uh, impact study report. As you know, it's required by CDE and the California Environmental Quality Act, commonly referred to as CEQA, and it's a process that we uh, need to engage in uh, as part of our building of the new elementary school. So uh, Gisela is here from Hexagon, and we'll walk you through a, really a summary of the traffic impact analysis. Um, good evening. Um, my name, like Alvaro said, it's um, Gisela Del Rio, and I'm with Hexagon Transportation Consultants. Um, we are the traffic engineering firm that prepared the traffic study for the new school project. Um, so tonight, I'm just going to um, briefly describe um, the traffic analysis, um, the methodology, and uh, the results. Um, and I'm going to try to, you know, um, briefly again describe how the procedures, how, how traffic studies are done, you know, and uh, what we're actually looking for in a traffic study. Um, so um, basically, um, any new development um, requires a new traffic uh, to, to um, prepare a traffic study. Um, that the traffic study will identify any, um, it, it will identify the effect of the new traffic added by the proposed development onto the roadway network. Um, most jurisdictions, like the city of Gilroy, for example, they have um, standard uh, adopted level service standards, or adopted um, standards for their intersections and roadways. And uh, what that is, um, they try to basically just uh, maintain acceptable what they, what they um, consider acceptable level of service or acceptable conditions at intersections. So by doing the traffic studies, um, we identify whether an, uh, a project will have an impact at one of the intersections or will deterior deteriorate the acceptable level of service um, to you know, unacceptable levels, then this project is required to mitigate the impact. Um, so you know, uh, like Alvaro said, um, we um, evaluated the, the, the proposed school and uh, <clears throat> I will describe what was um, included in the analysis, as you can see in this table. Um, let me give you a brief description of, of what the, the process is. So basically, um, when a new project is, is proposed, we estimate the traffic that this new project is going to generate based on you know, um, national standards that we typically use in traffic engineering. Um, then the traffic that we're estimating that this project will generate is basically added to the roadway network on top of existing traffic, on top of, on top of any project, any traffic um, associated with projects that haven't been approved. And uh, you know, they're projected to add this amount of traffic to the intersection. So we basically have the existing conditions, then we add the approved conditions, and we add the project, tra the project proposed project traffic. And based on that analysis, then we know whether the, um, the project will have an impact or um, at any of the study intersections or roadway segments or um, any other you know, facility uh, that the, the, um, the project is proposed or is projected to, um, to add traffic to. So um, in our analysis, um, you know, we, we did a, a trip generation estimate, which is the basis for the, uh, for the um, analysis. Um, our analysis assumes that it's going to be an 800 student school. Um, the, the trip generation rates that were utilized for this project uh, were actually derived from El Roble School. Uh, we wanted to, um, to, to, to derive the rates based on this school because um, this is an existing school in Gilroy and uh, it's located within the neighborhood, which is, we, we, um, you know, the, um, the school district in Alvaro is anticipating that, uh, that um, the new proposed school is gonna have very similar characteristics to this, uh, to a robot school. And they're anticipating that um, a lot of the students will actually be able to walk because it's gonna be located within a neighborhood, um, just like El Roble. So what we did, we basically went out to El Roble and we counted how many, um, <clears throat> how, how much traffic is actually being generated during drop off and during pickup hours. And actually during the, what is considered the peak hour of the adjacent street traffic, which is between four and, and six. So we came up with some rates um, based on those counts and we applied them to the proposed project to estimate how much traffic this new project is gonna generate. Um, then based on that, <clears throat> you know, we, we assigned this traffic to the roadway network and assume, okay, you know, um, these, uh, um, the traffic is gonna use these uh, streets or intersections to access the, the new school. In addition to that, 
The proposed project is being, uh, it's being proposed for a site that is currently approved for a residential development. So um, in order to give credit, you know, the, 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 the residential project on the site's already been approved, which means that the traffic associated with that project is already accounted for under background conditions. You know, I, I ex briefly explained that there's existing conditions, then there's approved conditions, and there's the project. So the approved um, project and the site's already under background conditions. So to take credit for that, um, as you can see on the table, we uh, actually <clears throat> estimated the traffic that will be generated by the approved project and subtracted it from the, um, the trip generation estimates for the school, basically taking credit for what's already been approved there. So. Um, based on that, on those, um, you know, assumptions and projections, uh, we're showing that um, the proposed new school will generate approximately 452 trips in the morning, a total of 452, 192 trips in the, in the afternoon, and, uh, and it actually gonna gen it's going to generate less traffic than if the residential development would, was, was to be developed there during, in the p.m. peak hour. Um, in addition to that, um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we also assume uh, because this school is going to serve the immediate vicinity, the immediate neighborhoods, we also assume that a lot of the traffic, 60% to be exact, uh, of the traffic that's going to be generated by the school, it's not necessarily generated by the school, but it's actually traffic that is already going to be on the roadway network on their way to work. Parents, for example, on, from home going to work. But now, since the school is there, they're going to go, instead of going from home to work, they're going to go from home to school to work. So they're not necessarily new trips, but they're existing trips or future trips that are already on the roadway network, and they're going to derive, um, you know, they're going to they're gonna, um, they're gonna, uh, go to the school on their way to work and drop off their kids or the same thing on the, on the way back home. So um, we assume that 60% of, of the trips would be um, those type of trips. 40%, uh, which is, uh, I believe it's a conservative um, uh, assumption, we assume that 40% would be totally new trips um, generated by the uh, adjacent neighborhoods, um, parents going to the school and uh, dropping off their kids and going back home. Um, so the next, um, the next um, uh, figure shown on the screen, um, the percentages that are shown on the screen, it's what we anticipate um, where we anticipate traffic is going to be coming from. We use those, um, you know, those are estimates. There's really no, um, no attendance area uh, de uh, de developed yet. So it's just an estimate based on where the, um, the houses are located and, uh, um, you know, where um, students could be coming from um, to the new school. Then on the, on the um, right side, we have the actual assignment of trips, project trips. Uh, I know it's kind of small to, you know, it's very small to, to look at it on the screen, but um, most of them are positive trips because they represent traffic going from home to school to drop off their kids and back from, from school back to work or, or um, you know, to home. Uh, you'll see a lot of negative trips also. Uh, those represent the traffic that instead of making, you know, instead of a, a club drive, instead of going straight because they're going to work, and, uh, if they're going northbound on club drive and going straight, instead they're going to make a right turn and then enter the school site and next it and show up as a, as a right turn again to go back to, to club drive. So there's a lot of negatives on, you know, on the assignment. Um, those also represent uh, the fact that with the um, future roadway network, uh, there's going to be access to both um, the existing middle school and the proposed new school through the back um, um, roadways, you know, the, the new uh, plan um, roadway network. Um, you know, besides Santa Teresa. So some of that traffic actually got shipped from Santa Teresa to the new streets, um, assuming that some of the parents that live there, instead of going to Santa Teresa, they'll just take the back streets to access the schools. Uh, <coughs> so I mentioned, you know, the cities, um, they have a level of service standard, and um, basically what that is, they try to, they try, uh, the level of service standard helps them maintain um, an acceptable acceptable conditions at their intersections. And if uh, any project um, deteriorates or goes um, beyond the level of service standard, then they're required to, mit to, um, to mitigate the impact, basically. So um, City of Gilroy, um, for most intersections in the City of Gilroy, the level of service, the level of service standard is level of service C. Um, level of service um, ranges from A to F, level of service A to level of service F. Uh, with level service A, of course, being no congestion at all, and level service F being very congested. 
So level of service C um, is actually the standard for most intersections in Gilroy. So in order for a project to create an impact at an intersection, if the intersection is currently operating at level of service A, B, or C, and the project, the addition of project traffic make is, makes the intersection go to a level of service D, uh, then that's automatically an impact. Um, if the intersection is already operating bad and the project adds traffic that, gen, uh, that uh, causes the delay at the intersection to increase by more than two or, you know, there's different criteria, but by more than two or one seconds, then that's considered an impact as well. So, um, and there's, you know, they're pretty much the same for signalized and unsignalized intersections. For unsignalized intersections, they also have to meet um, the signal warrant, which means is, uh, which um, that is, is that um, they have to, um, they have to, uh, the intersection would have to be signalized in order for it to operate um, at acceptable levels. Um, any impacts mitigated when the operations are, are um, restored back to acceptable conditions. So that's the, uh, the criteria. Now the results. We did our analysis, we run the level of service, you know, we, did, we typically do existing conditions. Back, ex what existing conditions is, is just we go out there, we get traffic counts from at the intersections, and we run the level of service. We use a software that is um, used in the entire county, um, and uh, um, we run the level of service with the existing conditions, you know, existing intersection lane geometry. Uh, existing traffic volumes. If it's signalized, you know, uh, based on the existing, the operations of the uh, current um, uh, traffic signal. Uh, if it's unsignalized, whether it's a two-way, a four-way, or, you know, a T intersection, you know, whatever that, that geometry may be. So background conditions, again, is just existing volumes uh, with the addition of any traffic that is planned or that is projected to be generated by um, approved projects in the city of Gilroy. In this case, um, background conditions in includes all of the Glen Loma project because that's already an approved project and it's uh, next to the, to the proposed project. So all the traffic that is um, projected to be generated by Glen Loma is included under background conditions. Then on top of that, we go to background plus project conditions, which it's basically we just add project traffic associated with the proposed new school. Um, as you can see, there's actually, um, we identify one impact. Um, the impacts at the intersection of Santa Teresa and Third. Uh, the impact is projected because the intersection um, is actually projected to be a level service F under background conditions with all the Glen Loma traffic, with all the Hecker Pass Pacific Bank traffic, with any other uh, approved project traffic. It's already uh, projected to be operating in level acceptable, unacceptable level service F under background conditions. So the addition of project traffic, um, it's, uh, it creates the intersection delay to increase by more than two seconds, um, so that's uh, that's an impact. That's that's considered an impact. Um, there's other um, all the other intersections. They're either operating fine, um, so uh, there's really no impacts, or there's another one, uh, Miller and Santa Teresa, where it's actually operating unacceptably under background conditions. But the fact that we actually are removing traffic from that intersection with the school. Um, uh, you know, and removing traffic, uh, it's, it's due to um, the removal of the, of the residential units on the site and the, uh, um, the reassignment of existing traffic due to the new roadway segment. Um, because we're actually removing traffic from there, the delay is actually negative, so there's no, there's no impact. Um, so there's, uh, it's shown to be, there's shown, there, we, um, <clears throat> we uh, project that there's gonna be one uh, intersection impact. Um, during all uh, three um, peak, hour, uh, peak hours that we analyzed. Um, peak hours is typically uh, when the traffic on the roadway is the highest. Typically for traffic studies, we do two peak hours, which is the AM peak hour. It's an hour between seven and nine when the traffic is the, the heaviest. Uh, and that's typically when everybody's going to work, everybody's going to school, so there's, mm, that's the, when the most congested conditions on the roadway occur. Then the PM, it's from four to, to six, an hour between four and six, which is when everybody's coming home from work and you know, again, traffic is, you know, it's, it's the worst. So that, those are the two typical um, peak hours that we, that we typically analyze for a traffic study. In this case, because the school actually, the school's peak hour it's actually um, in the morning and in the afternoon. We also included the afternoon peak hour. Um, and as you can see, all three peak hours are, are being um, impacted at the intersection of Santa Teresa and Third Street with the project. 
So th that's for the, um, the intersection analysis. Um, another thing that we included in our study, um, we were directed or were, we were, um, you know, we, we were told that um, the school um, was, is, is proposing to have staggered times with the um, middle school. So we did some, um, an analysis um, assuming that the proposed new school would start 30 minutes after the, the middle school. This is not the, um, the standard or the, the typical um, way to analyze, um, to do an analysis. But so this is the reason why we just kind of did it, you know, as additional information, because this is not the, the actual methodology that the city or, you know, the, um, <clears throat> or CEQA, you know, requires. CEQA requires that uh, the analysis be based on the P conditions. So, but uh, just for the purpose of this, you know, we did, we, we did an analysis where we said, okay, this is what would happen if we look at half an hour after the peak hour. And uh, the, con uh, the, the level of service condition shows that um, the level of service would actually improve, uh, but the, the impact at Santa Teresa and Third would still be there, would still, um, would still occur. Um, the reason for the impact, it's because um, the intersection is projected to operate at level of service F under background conditions. So when an intersection is already operating bad, um, it takes very minimal traffic for it to, to be impacted. You know, uh, in other words, if it's operating at level service A, it has a lot of capacity to add 100 more trips and it'll be fine. If it's already operating at a level service F, the capacity is already, you know, it's already at capacity and one trip would trigger an impact basically. Um, so that's the reason why there, there's an impact there. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, uh, the other thing, the other requirement um, of traffic studies, um, at least here for the city of Gilroy, is um, we have to check um, the adequacy of lef left turn storage. So, uh, you know, basically if we're adding more than 10 trips, that's kind of a rule of thumb. Um, if we're adding more than 10 trips to a left, a, a left, a left turn movement, um, then uh, we're supposed to check to make sure that, um, that left, turn, left turn storage is gonna be adequate with the project. So, um, because we're adding most of the traffic to the southbound left turn on Club Drive, um, I mean on Santa Teresa to Club Drive, um, people coming from the north uh, turning into, into Club Drive, uh, we check that movement. And, we also, and, and we're also adding a significant number of volume of trips to the westbound left turn, people exiting the school going southbound on, on Monterey, I mean, uh, sorry, on Santa Teresa. Um, so we check those two movements and, uh, and we, um, uh, it shows that um, the westbound left turn pocket will be inadequate under background plus project conditions as well as the, um, the southbound left. The southbound left is projected to be about 100 uh, feet short. That's about four, five vehicles that are gonna extend out of the pocket. Uh, the, the westbound left turn, it's shown to be um, 25 feet, which is about one vehicle. Um, that's, another, that's considered another impact um, based on city of Gilroy standards. Um, and uh, the mitigation for that would be um, extending the left turn pocket to accommodate the, um, the additional queue um, on, the, on the pocket. Um, that some, pretty much summarizes the results. Um, I guess I should, I should point out that the stagger analysis, we also did uh, the, the operations analysis, the queue analysis for the staggered uh, scenario. And it actually shows that uh, with the stagger um, scenario, uh, there will only be, um, I believe it was 25 feet. Um, it, it would only exceed the southbound left turn uh, pocket by one vehicle, 25 feet. Um, so that pretty much summarizes uh, the, um, the results of the analysis. Um, those were the two impacts that were identified in the traffic study. Thank you very much. Questions? Trustee Good. Yes, yeah, so I noted in your report that uh, the adequacy of the parking was not evaluated because you didn't have the size of the auditorium? That's correct. And do we not, and this is for Mr. Uh, Alvaro, do, did we not, do we not have a size? Has that not been established? <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think we have established that. I don't think it's going to impact the report or any mitigations that would trigger anything with CEQA. Uh, okay. Do, what, what is, based on the parking lot size, what is the, ma based on the amount of parking spaces, what is the maximum size of the auditorium? I, um, based on the amount of parking, 
that's being planned, what is the maximum size of the auditorium? The, the parking spaces are based on, um, the required number of parking spaces are based on, um, I believe for an elementary school, it's based on the number of um, staff and faculty um, in addition to the auditorium. So I don't know the exact number. I, don't, I know it's on the report, but I don't know, I don't know it out of the top of my head. The parking spaces are around 143 or so between both the staff parking lot and the other one in front of the school. Um, just for comparison, this elementary will have um, more parking than any other elementary. The auditorium in size, um, it's comparable to what we have at Rucker. And this elementary will have more spaces in terms of parking than Rucker. So I think we should I be more than okay. I sent the board the chart that you and James gave me showing yes. that, that, so I, that I don't, this will have more parking issue. than any of the elementary schools. Right. I, I, there's been some talk of potentially making the auditorium even bigger. So I'm wondering what are our limits. That's the reason for, oh. for my question. Okay. So now that we understand your question, we'll have to answer that later. Okay. I don't <coughs> – having an auditorium doesn't change the number of kids that go to a school. I don't see – and, and so if we're talking about after hours, which are non-peak hours, then, then it's not an issue either way. So why is that in here? Right. I, I don't think that would be actually a, a, an impact based on CEQA, you know, and, and um, like you mentioned, you know, if there was for some reason there was a shortage in parking, there's always, uh, you know, some, some type of agreement could, come, could be come between the district and the, and, the, and the city or, you know, whoever needs to um, um, approve the project. Um, just saying that there's uh, the, the district approves the project, <laughs> right? <laughs> so just saying that the adjacent school actually has a, a you know parking if needed. Right. Uh, if there if there's no need of initial additional parking, there's additional parking at the adjacent school. I right. mean that's that's another. Okay. Actually, it's kind of unlimited compared to other elementary schools okay. because you've got all the parking next door at the uh, middle school. And, and my next question, so it's, it's my understanding that the only roundabout being recommended by the study is the one at Club and Grenache? Uh, that is correct. Um, the city actually, um, um, in the past, the city uh, was actually contemplating um, turning uh, Club and Santa Teresa into a roundabout. And uh, our analysis shows that if they turn that intersection into a roundabout without any other improvement, without add adding additional lanes, uh, the intersection actually operates worse than it with the signal. And in, in the event there was, there was a dispute between the district and the city on putting a roundabout on Club of Grenache, who would have the final say on that? You know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure about that because that actually, you know, the roads are, prop, are, are um, jurisdiction of the city. Uh, the school itself, it, it, the, the city doesn't have to approve it, you know, like you said, the, the district is its own agency, uh, but the actual roadway, any improvements to the roadway, uh, they have to go through the city. Um, so it's, you it, know, that's... That. So, so if the traffic study showed that a roundabout was required, the city doesn't have to comply with that. They can, they can do whatever they want. It can, it, it's up to the city to, you know, they, they can say, well, we don't, you know, even though this, this, the traffic study is recommending a roundabout, we don't want a roundabout. We want a, a, a regular intersection. And it's up to the city what they want to do, basically. And, what, and so is the city the agency that, that ultimately approves or disapproves of the traffic study? Uh, not in this case. I, I, don't, I don't believe so. No, I think it goes to, um, <clears throat> to, to, the, to the state, right? Right. Well, would the city have problems with the state if, if they said, no, we don't want a roundabout there? We want a, a signalized intersection? Uh, you know, the city um, can comment on this traffic analysis. The city can request uh, whatever they want. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that the district gets its own agency, and they're the ones who approve it. Um, and, you know, and Albert and, and I talked about this. Um, there's, there needs to be some type of negotiation between the city just because they will have to provide encroachment permits and all that. So in order to facilitate the actual construction of the school, they, the city does need to be involved. And, and, and hopefully, you know, the city's happy and there's no problems providing you with whatever you guys need. But uh, the actual approval, it's, it's not up to the city. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, I think it's, it's up to the school district uh, what they want to do. Great. Thank you. Yes. Um, so am I reading it correctly? Background is all the projects. So anything that's background that's already uh, doesn't meet the city's level of service, who, whose mitigations are those? 
you know, anything under background um, is supposed to already have had um, its share of, uh, uh, you know, of improvements. Uh, for example, any project that's already included under the background conditions, they went through the exact same process. Um, presumably, they were the, the same impacts were identified, and they had to implement some type of improvement to mitigate their impact. Or pay TIF fees. Uh, TIF, exactly. So um, the fact that now um, the level of service is actually, you know, uh, is shown to be worse, uh, and this is actually a projection too. So um, you know, it's it's uh, it's the best, uh, I guess, uh, information that we have available. So um, the fact that it's shown that the, is the level of service F, um, it, it could be just that um, the traffic conditions actually uh, changed more or uh, were more drastic than what was projected 10 years ago when the Glen Loma project was, was approved, for example. You know, I'm just throwing the Glen Loma project because that's the, the, the biggest project there. But we would only, <clears throat> the impacts we caused, the 30, 40 right. feet. That, that's what, right, right, we can't so solve all the world's problems. Ex exactly. So, okay. you, yeah, the schools only uh, require, the school districts only require to improve whatever they're, you know, um, I guess, impacting or, or um, making worse. Do we have any other questions, comments? This is an information item. Correct. Thank you very much for your report. The next item on the agenda is student achievement results, the 2017 California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, otherwise known as the CASP. And this is also an information item. And Kermit Schrock, our Program Administrator for Student Assessment and Data Management, will present the 2017 CASP results. All right, good evening. Uh, Dr. Flores, President Mitcard, members of the board. I'll be here this evening to talk about the uh, 2017 CASP results for Gilroy Unified. Um, actually, in the context of our past three years, we're in our third year of CASP, and this opening slide here, maybe the tests aren't so new anymore, right? We're, we're a little more familiar with them. We've, we've talked about them uh, from time to time. I think the, the location of this uh, presentation actually tonight, uh, it's actually a little late this year. It's often given a little earlier in the year, but the state um, had a little delay in the, the release of results. They were doing some analysis. Apparently there was some uh, confusion across the state, some mix-up in the reporting of some of the special ed uh, scores. But, um, However, having said all that, I think it falls very well to fall right in the middle of our SIPSA presentations, right? Because tonight I'm sharing just some, some district-wide data. We're going to be looking at subgroups. We're looking at performance over the past three years. You know, what are, what are some of the positives? What are some of the negatives? But the, the perfect thing is, like this evening, seeing the three middle schools talk about their specific data and seeing their actions, right? I, I'm, I'm not talking about the actions we're taking here. I'm, we're looking at the data, right, kind of reflectively. But it's great to see the high schools two weeks ago, the middle schools tonight, talk about, okay, what actions are taking place? You know, we, you know I may make some mentions, okay, I know an adoption is being rolled out at a certain grade level here and there. And I may um, um, make some projections or some guesses about how that might play out. But it, uh, it's great to hear. Um, those specific school actions and how they're, um, you know, working to, to keep our district moving forward, right? Um, the tests themselves, um, as we've said before, it's all computer-based, all right? The uh, tests are given at grades 3 through 8 and 11 um, in English language arts and math. Um, they are computer-based, computer-adaptive for part of them in which the test starts out at grade level for every student and then makes slight adjustments to get slightly harder or slightly easier over the course of those approximately um, 30 to 40 computer adaptive questions that the students see. It doesn't go down super low, it doesn't go super high. Um, it appears that maybe about a grade or two variation as the, uh, and kind of over the second part of the test. So just in terms of what you, um, what you think of when we think of a computer adaptive, it's very different from um, we have the star reading test, which we use as our English language benchmark in grades uh, two through eight. That test does uh, go very low. If we have a seventh grader that's um, struggling um, significantly in their reading, it can go down to the second grade level for that student. And so the students will see much lower level questions till the, till the computer really gets a sense of what level that student is at, and then it all goes up into the high school level as well. The CASP tests do not vary that much. In addition, on both the English language and math tests, there is that 
reading component that doesn't exist, or a re a writing component um, that doesn't exist on some of our other uh, multiple choice types of um, uh, computer-based assessments. So that, as, as uh, Principal Mondragon pointed out, watching those subtest scores and writing for a school is, is one of those things that's very good to watch. Are the writing programs being implemented at a specific school paying off in some of those uh, specific subtests? The science test made its move this past spring um, to the computer-based assessment, uh, now uh, focusing on the next generation science standards, uh, no longer having to administer the, the CST science standards, which as teachers starting to teach to the new standards, having to assess on the old standards, caused a little bit of a friction for a, for a year or so there. However, there were no results. It was a pilot this past year. Um, it is approximately, the science test is approximately a, going to be a two-hour test. They, every student took a half of that, about a one-hour pilot last spring at fifth, eighth, and tenth grades. Now this year is going to be what they're going to call the field test, so it's another year without results. Unfortunately, they're going to now field test the entire two-hour assessment um, for every fifth grade, uh, fifth, eighth, and um, high school student. Um, and the high school layout uh, uh, rollout's going to be a, a bit interesting to do. I'm going to be talking with principals. Actually, I'm hoping to be on the agenda next week with principals to, uh, to discuss that high school rollout of how you know, what's that right grade level to, uh, to assess at for the high school level? Um, so just to start out, um, the overall scores for Gilroy Unified um, fairly maintain the results from the year before in 2016, equal to the state. All state also saw some similar trends. There were some gains at specific grade levels in ELA, third and eighth, some certain gains at, at ga specific grade levels at fourth, fifth, eighth, and eleventh. But I just want to kind of look at this chart to look at kind of what's happened the past three years. And I think I want to say, you know, my, much of my presentation, we're going to look at, okay, where were, where were, if we were flat, what does that mean, right? Where were some strengths? Where were some weaknesses? But I also want to say we, we compare ourselves to the state. We want to say, oh, you know, we're, we're above the state average, which is very good. We always want to compare ourselves to, to uh, out, outside contexts. But I think it's also very important to say that just because we're above the state, just because we didn't drop too much, that isn't where we want to be, right? We, we want to see what are our plans, both in professional development and curricular rollout in specific school plans to keep us moving forward, right? Um, and so while I do make statements about, okay, we're above here, we're outperforming this here, yes, our scores are flat, and we want to see what can we do this next year to keep moving forward as a district. I was just at the, uh, every, many other districts are having these same conversations right now. It's the uh, CDE uh, last week in which they talked about the rate, uh, results and one of the first things they said is everybody's been calling us saying, what's, what's wrong with the test? Why are our scores all flat? And they said, well, it was interesting, the year before when all of our scores went up, nobody called and asked what was wrong with the test, right? <laughs> all of a sudden everybody's like, what's wrong with the test? Something, something's, something's wrong. From the state point of view, from the state point of view, the, the uh, cyclometrician actually said, we like to see flat results because it means there's a stability to the test. Okay, they like to see flat results. We don't necessarily want to see flat results in our district, right? We want to keep seeing that over uh, ongoing improvement. But they, as a, at a state level, don't want to see huge fluctuations happening from year to year, right? We want to keep seeing that, that, that increase going up. Having said all that, we do want to just, you know, it's always worth comparing ourselves. Where are we, you know, in terms of our performance, looking at the state? And so they were flat both for us and, and for the state level. We are still, um, um, we're right at the level of the state in English language arts in terms of the uh, percentage of students scoring um, level three or four meeting or exceeding standard and slightly above the state um, in mathematics. So we do see that trend continue. At some of the grade levels, we can see where some grade levels um, made some, some uh, slight gains, some grade levels had some drops this past year. So I think that just because the test leveled out doesn't mean that we can't continue to have gains, right? And we saw those gains. Now the challenge is to continue to have those gains at all grade levels, right, or the majority of grade levels. I think one of the big successes we saw was at the 11th grade level that I really want to point out. And that was a grade level that we were severely underperforming the state. If we look back to three years ago, those 11th grade ELA, this is the English language arts scores here, the, the uh, blue, the dark blue here for the, for the first year, right, in English language arts for 11th grade, it was the one grade level that we're severely underperforming. So it's great to see those trends continue. Actually, now we are right at the state level. So to see those trends continue in the future and outperform and have 
over 60% of our students, but I think that is a, a great number to see that 60% you know, of our students performed at the level three or four, because those are our juniors, those are the students who we wanna see, that's the 60% that are now you know, ready or conditionally ready for college level material, that's, that's the percent we wanna see, and we should see that play out hopefully over the next years then in terms of um, 12th grade performance and college, college going rates, so it'll be, it'll be great to watch and see how those play out in the future as well. You know, it's a, the, the ELA in particular, you know, the third grade starts out very low. I think um, in ELA, if we just compare third grade, and the so you see the trend over the grade levels, kind of an increasing performance over those early grades, right? And part of it, it you, if we think of our, cat, our CST scores in the past, used to be, oh, our elementary scored pretty high, and then our middle schools dropped, and uh, where was it? Well, all of a sudden, did we have some big turnaround instructionally? And, and, and performance, you know, part of that is probably familiarity with technology as well as a test. I think um, I've been around watching third graders take the ELA test. Um, so other people have been around uh, watching third graders try to do their, their paragraph writing on the computer. Is it right or wrong to have third graders take the, take the test on the computer? That's not my job to say, but it's something we have to keep working towards, right? And we have to realize that there is going to be some developmental issues there, perhaps over the next years as we continue to do uh, keyboarding, as as more technology happens at the early grades, right? We have a lot of technology we push at those upper elementary, middle school, which is great, right? Seeing, uh, hearing about study sync rollout that has a at the uh, middle school level that has a large technology component, it's going to be great for building that familiarity with with writing and reading on the screen as opposed to the textbook, right? Well, well we should see those kind of things pay off um, on these kinds of assessments as well. If you look at the math, we see a, a very different story if you think about the across grade trends, right? If you think about where third grade starts out um, and fourth, fifth, fifth uh, has struggled um, district and statewide, to, right, to have that, that um, those scores measure up uh, across the grade levels. Um, once again, the 11th grade did have nice increases, but 11th grade math scores are are uh, very low comparatively to the compared to to most of the other grade levels. But it's testing all students on that math three curriculum, algebra, geometry, and algebra two, math one, two, and three components all together for expected of all 11th graders. So the fact that we have all 11th graders on this A through G track, we should continue to see that. So this past year, this was our first year in which all 11th graders took, um, well, it, it phased in. It was math three or higher this past year. Um, and now this year, um, all 11th graders are in math three or three plus or higher. Apart from a few students here there who have failed courses and do have to, to repeat, it's, uh, it is the pathway for the vast majority of, of 11th graders. But coming back to the, the trend, now we see third graders where there isn't as high a writing component. We have to see, okay, there is a performance there, but as the math has gotten harder over the grades, we do see that drop statewide, and our job is to buck that trend, right, as a district, as we implement um, our, our professional development and our programs. Uh, Trustee Pisano, uh, uh, during one of the um, study session um, presentations today, liked to look at, uh, made the comment of looking at cohorts and looking at cohorts across, right, and so you can look at some of those. You know, I, when I see this trend statewide, of, of how this performance plays out, like third, fourth, fifth, you look at statewide going from high to middle, low. It concerns me then, if it's not a kind of an even statewide across, then it kind of sets ourselves up to say, oh, those fifth grade teachers aren't doing very well, but, but look, the, uh, the sixth grade teachers did great and when all the scores statewide kind of surged there. If we saw kind of a statewide trend at all around the mid points across all grades, then I'd say, I'd feel more confident to say, let's look at cohorts across those grade levels, but some of these grades, I'm, I'm a little hesitant sometimes to look at that. Um, but for example, seventh to eighth, where I see the trade, six, seventh, eighth, you see the statewide data, 36, 37, 36. We see some very s similar trends in, in Gilroy. I say, that would be some good cohorts to look at, seventh to eighth. Let's look at the seventh to eighth cohort, for example, right? Then I would feel confident to look at those. So that'd be the one caveat sometimes when we do look at, at cohort data. Comparing ourselves to neighboring counties, to our own county, seeing some similar trends as last year. Um, a, a lot of flat in the counties. I have to give kudos to San Benito. They are the one county that did buck that trend in our area. Uh, Santa Clara was very was flat, but uh, San Benito did 
continue to make growth at, at uh, both of those levels, at both, uh, in both uh, English language arts and math, I mean, in 2017, from 16 to 17. But we see some of the, the similar trends across the uh, remaining areas. Also flat in our subgroups, but I think it's important just to look, just to make sure we know we have an achievement gap that was brought out this evening. We have achievement, that achievement gap still exists. Um, we did not decrease that achievement gap. I guess on the plus side, no increase to that achievement gap, right? So it is flat in all subgroups there. Um, the one thing I do want to point out on the, uh, is the, the group EverEL, which is a new subgroup that the state is, is highlighting as opposed to breaking, well, they also allow you to break down EL performance versus RFET performance. But I've said in the past, I'm always a little hesitant on that because we have different reclassification rates. We reclassify all of our English learners that, that are proficient in March. And then a month later, all those that were left, we're going to test them and say, oh, why didn't you do very well? Well, we just reclassified all the students who were doing very well a month before. Now we give all the rest of them a test and say, oh, our English learners aren't doing well. Well, let's give them another, another year to progress. They will. We'll reclassify another bunch that next March. But of course, then you're going to test again right after you reclassified them. Kind of a, a catch-22 there in terms of looking at CAS data. That's why we have a separate report, right, where we look at English learner data on, their, on the English learner exam, the CELT. Well, we, we used to have that. There, there won't be one this year. But come next fall, I'll be here to report about on the uh, LPAC, the new uh, assessment results. This, however, takes all the RFFs and ELs together and says any student that started in your district as an EL, no matter what you call them now, no matter what your reclassification criteria is, whether it's really stringent or, or a little looser, let's look at all those together. Um, I'm not sure if I, I like the term every EL, but that's the term the state's using, so we'll use it. But it means every student that started out as an English learner, how is that performance? So 37% of them in the district, right at the, exactly at the state level, um, scored um, at the level three or four level, right? If I, if I pulled up our EL and RFEP data, what would it be, right? Our RFEPs have always performed 50, 60 percent, right? Because by definition, we reclassify them when they are nearly proficient. So by definition, they should be scoring nearly proficient on, on the exam. And English learners, as I said before, are always performance on CASP is always going to be very low because we reclassify right before this exam. And mathematics, we see some similar differences between the uh, subgroups. Um, oh, on the uh, every EL, there is just one year of data. They, this is the first year they've broken that out as a subgroup. That's why I don't have any comparative data. But now, as they continue to report that data out, both for our district and for county and state, we'll be able to follow that and, and watch a, a similar trend um, apart from anybody's reclassification criteria. Let's see. That was it. On the so uh, a different slide this year than I've uh, we've looked at in the past. We talk about our subgroups, but and we we talk about Hispanic subgroup. You know, oh, that's just one of our subgroups in Gilroy, but really Hispanics in Gilroy make up seventy percent of our student population. So it may be a subgroup, but it is the majority of our students in in Gilroy. So I think it's important to to pull that out in the state. Um, has now allowed us to look at the Hispanic subgroup or any racial subgroup that you have in your district and, and divide that subgroup by those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged and those who are not. So you can kind of separate maybe, you know, what people might want to trend to say is a race issue or ethnicity issue from an economic issue, a socioeconomic issue, which we know impacts student achievement and, and student learning. So in this case, 70% of our students in, in Gilroy, the vast majority, um, following the ethnicity, ethnicity of Hispanic, um, Hispanic of any race is actually the, the state now. If you see reports from the state level, it won't say just, it won't, it's not pretending that Hispanic's race Hispanic and it will be Hispanics of any race. So we may have many people in Gilroy who might be a certain race that also rec uh, recognize themselves as Hispanic. The state then will put them in that category for any kind of um, state reporting purposes, a, um, any of our different reports that we have. And in this case, the uh, the test results. So of those 70% of students who are Hispanic uh, um, or Latino of any race, these are the groups who are economically disadvantaged. And so I thought it was important here to see, okay, in English language arts and math, those scores are, are low. How does that compare to the county? Oftentimes 
we talk about, oh, the county, what, the county is a different, well, the county is very different. And if we compare ourselves to, to other, all other Hispanic Latino students that are economically disadvantaged in the county, we will see that we are at the, or above the level in, in uh, English language arts and mathematics outperforming. So that's 70% of our, of our population. Now we take the other half, the other half that are not socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, once again, perf outperforming or performing the same level of those across the county. And, you know, I think it's important to point out that that 57% that are meeting or exceeding in English and 47% that are meeting students in math, our district average in English was 49%, right? And our district average in English was 40%. So significantly outperforming our district average. I think it's important just to, to keep those things in mind. Where is that group in, in regard to the district, as regard to the state, and in regard to the county as we, as we make these subgroup comparisons? Not to say there isn't an achievement gap, not to say there aren't issues we have to address, but just another way to look at the data. Just to, to show a sample student report, some of you might be getting these. We uh, just got these. Um, uh, ready to send out, so parents will be getting these. Um, sh some should be next week. And now they'll actually, for those students who have three years of data, so I'm showing you a fifth grade report because that is a grade level that will get to see three years of data now. The parents will get to see where were they in third, where were they in fourth, where were they in fifth. So fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade graders will get to see. Third graders will just have one bar. Fourth graders will have two bars and get to see both in English language arts and math. Where are, are is, the, is the dot moving up, right? Are they staying in the, in the level? What other particular subgroup uh, or uh, claim area issues, if there are? And just to once again remind you, know, in addition to our summative tests, we do have interim tests that we do uh, roll out with all of our elementary, middle, and high schools throughout the year. This is, you can see, this is just an example of sixth grade tests, but it gives you an example of the different tests that, that the state has made available with CASP items that. Um, Teachers can give. We actually there's a rolling out the training this this month, so that starting in November, all the way through, you know, as late as is appropriate, March uh, is kind of the latest we recommend, so we don't kind of infringe on getting kids, you know, too over tested by the time the, the actual summative test comes out. But so that that both in in the key areas in mathematics, key areas in English, students have a chance to practice the assessment. Teachers have a chance to see the assessment, see their students struggle with different types of items. They can use some of these assessment items. They can put them up in the projector, talk about them in class. It's not something that can't be talked about. These are to talk about. These are for students and teachers to, to benefit from in any way possible. And um, one thing that teachers will be excited about this year is the state is finally giving teachers more data from these items. In the past, it was kind of just a generic, how'd they do? Oh, they did high, medium, or low. And now actually teachers could drill into a specific item and say, oh, on, on number three, I saw my students struggling with it. I really want to see how my class did on number three. So state's just rolling that, that new system out now. We'll get the teachers trained on it so they can take advantage as much as possible to, to administer these, some of these interim assessments um, throughout the school year. And I'm not going to go into to this other data tonight, um, but I just want to once again remind you this is all just one part of our LCAP, right? This is the... Um, one test that's given, the CAS test, sure, it's an important one, but to, to remind ourselves to keep it in the context of our overall uh, uh, achievement as a district, right? We have um, A through G requirements, we have graduation rates, we have AP, I'll be here in, in a month or so, right, talking of advanced placement results. We follow our Fontes Panel at the kindergarten level and the first grade level to track how are they doing learning English, as they've talked about with the SEAL program. Around goal three, we track our attendance rate, our chronic absentee rate. We saw some of those the, today in some of the presentations. Our dropout rate and um, Healthy Kids Survey. And in fact, I, I think we'll be coming back with a little bit of a summary on Healthy Kids Survey in a, um, in a month uh, for the board as well. So all in the, the context of our total, total LCAP plan. I think that's all I have for this evening. Right, Any questions? Questions, board members? I, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see. If a student is scoring at a certain level. Like on the student report here? There we go. Right. Okay. And so the teacher gets this information back. 
remember when in map testing, you, you could actually see what skills were missing to get the student to the next level? Yeah. So <laughs> is CAS providing that level of information? They don't. So no. if you look at those three, like yeah. this is, um, we're looking at mathematics here. Yeah. So concepts and procedures, which basically means all the math you taught. Right? And so you can't say, oh, were they weak in geometry? Were they weak in numbers on, in base 10? Were they ordered in operation, orders and operations or algebraic? You don't know. And so that's where we have to have our own uh, assessments where we do give a benchmark in November that tests numbers in base 10 for multiplication division. Then teachers can go in there and see where their students are weak or strong as they continue to, to continue that instruction. But the, the CASP itself, does not give that level of, of specificity. And CASP have, have said um, there's going to be a variety of what a certain student or students will see in concepts and procedures. They're not going to guarantee that everybody got the same number of questions in geometry as the next person next to them. It's going to be right. overall fourth grade level or a little above or a little below concepts for fourth grade. There'll be, it does, they do say, Yes, at fourth grade, it's going to be heavy on multiplication, division, and fractions, because those are the key concepts. But they're not going to say, guarantee that everybody got the exact same number of items of every, of every area, for example. And they, won't, they don't give that specificity of data back. Now, that, not to say in the future they will, but I, I haven't heard anything planned. Yeah. OK, I was just asking, yeah. because you, said you made reference to, you said materials are provided to teachers so they can put an example problem on the overhead. So the then on the interim process. assessment, so then these interim assessments are available. So here, yeah. now we do have it. So now, okay. um, now we have a geometry test with 12 geometry items at the sixth grade geometry level. And that one now, that's, so the teacher teaches that geometry unit and maybe completes that instruction in February. They could give this interim assessment. Now they can get some specific CASP exact ty item type um, data back and this year, they'll be able to go into that and look at that specific, any specific items. They'll say, you know what, I really know I taught questions three and four really well. I, I want to see, did that play out on how the students answered, or was there a misconception there that I wasn't aware of? And that level of data wasn't available on the interims of the past. So um, I think teachers have, teachers have been begging for it. So I, might, I know a lot of teachers will be happy to have this level of, of uh, a chance to get into some of that, some of that uh, specific items as they okay. give the interims. So the sample student report at fifth grade, <clears throat> that comes to the parent and it comes to the teacher, correct? The, the, just, to the just to the parent. The, we do give the teacher reports at the beginning of the year. We work with our, um, our data warehouse to make sure that the teachers get the overall cast for multiple years along with their star reading scores, their math benchmarks from the previous year, and their CELT. So the teachers have a variety of, of, of multiple measures of data that they can have coming in. Elementary does this. It's available for elementary students, but as elementary people know, they do that often with the placement cards, right? But to kind of say, it, for the middle and high schools now, in addition, we have data charts that, we, that are able to run for teachers. They can run their own the first day of school to see both those CASP scores and in the context of, of something else, because the CASP score says a two. Okay, they nearly met the standard. I want to know what their star reading score was. I want to know what their math benchmark score was. Right? I want to know a little bit more than just a two. It doesn't quite tell you enough by itself. Right. It might give you a trend of this student over a period of years, mm -hmm. but we can't use that to, to uh, do any close diagnosis right, of what, what the student needs. Right? So the parent gets this, and there's no explanation. I mean, there's there a little is, explanation is, here. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, this is a part of a two-page Okay. Report. I didn't. I did. I just did a clip of the graph. Okay. So down below, there is some explanation of how to interpret those. On the back side, there's some additional explanation and website reference um, okay. for parents. So there is more than this. I'm sorry. Yeah, I can. I can um, send a link of the entire sample report if you'd like, just to see what the total uh, report would, does look like that parents will receive. I'd like to see that. Okay, that I sounds just, great. I just think for the benefit of the parents, that I hope right. they get more than just this. And then we in the. In the letter, in the results that we mail home, there's also the state has developed a Spanish translation of the entire report. So we put that into every student's report so that they have it available to them to see. Okay, what was this part? They can refer to the Spanish translation. So okay. we do mail so that. Okay. So in other districts that have other languages other than Spanish, I, I assume the state's tailoring it. They to the have. States? They 
Like Vietnamese? Correct. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know that uh, over time they do produce the translations. I couldn't tell you right at this moment of this because they've changed the report every year right now because this is now the third year of CASP, so there's three years of results. So I couldn't say is the Vietnamese report ready or not, but <laughs> I know. that is correct. I yeah. mean, in, in many ways we're lucky because we have one second language. In terms of the majority of our, well, our population. Well, the students fall correct. into that. So. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, other questions? comments? Yes. Just a curiosity on the um, slide with the um, interim assessment. At the top of one of those columns, it says IAB. What is? So these are called the uh, interim assessment blocks, blocks. because they're okay. they're they're um, in blocks that are you can assess one little one little portion of the CASP. Sure, um, I just wasn't sure. Exactly. What was. Yeah, good question. And and the, what it has there is. Do you have to score any items to get results? And so we make sure to show those to teachers so that if a teacher administers a test that has a, an item that has to be scored, they would have to go online on the system, score that student's item before they get results for the test. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean it's not, if the teacher says, I don't have time to score this interim test, I've already got my own test I'm scoring, that doesn't mean it's not valuable to administer that read literary text interim block because you can still watch your students work with it, you could see where they're struggling, you could watch as they're answering questions, and you could bring it up later in the classroom and say, let's do this one together. I saw a lot of you struggling with it. So there's lots of, of ways that can be used in the classroom, whether or not you chose to, a teacher chose to score or not score. Um, in addition to the block that the state provides, they provide a comprehensive full SBAC assessment of 42 questions that you could administer to your class and get a, and you would actually get a score sheet that you could print out from the system of what level are they and what are their, what are their areas of the claims. I had one teacher in a middle school do that a couple years ago. She went through the whole process, ad administered it, scored all of her students, and I said, how did, she's like, it's not worth it. You know, yeah, it was nice, but the amount of time for kids testing, the amount of time to score, and so, you know, I, I, that was my guess also, and it's certainly out, it's available for every teacher to use if they wanted, but it's a lot of class time. And so um, our recommendation is, is, is to really focus on these blocks. What are the blocks that could be most useful to you as a teacher and at the same time prepare students for the, for the assessment? Speaking of testing, you, um, the science test, two hours, I assume that that is not two consecutive hours, that that's meted out over time or... You got a problem with two hours testing? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> only for a fifth grader. Um, right. It's a, all of these tests, are, it's up to the site and the age level of the students Indeed. to decide how to roll them out. It can be done Great. over three days. It can be done over one day. And so sometimes at the 11th grade level, it's, it's better to get a kid and get them to focus down and get it done. Third grader, to break it up over multiple days. And so any of those options are available, and, and, and sites do often do different things at different grade levels. Sure. Correct. Thanks. Yeah. Talk about how this information relates to the dashboard. And would yeah. So let's go look at our, so our results. Do I have a, I don't have one that's. So the dashboard rolled out last spring, right? And uh, last spring they took the 2015 results to the 2016 results and then gave us a color. How do we do from 15 to 16? And they said, what was your average, how far was your average score from a certain level and did you make improvement or not? And then that's going to give that pie color. So for example, then we saw, oh, we went from 43% to 49% um, and from 37 to 40% in English and math, we made growth. And sure enough, it played out that way that in the calculation of the average scale score growth. We made average scale score growth is what they're looking at. They don't look, look at it quite the same way, and that's what gave us our pie color. So what's gonna happen this year? Well, I can tell you, our average scale score stayed flat, and on the dashboard, I'll, the dashboard should be released, I think, uh, end of November, 1st of December, so probably in January, with this data for CASP. And so then um, our level will probably, well, they'll. After that first rollout, we don't know how they're going to tweak some of the numbers, but if, it, if they kept the same categories as before, we fell in the lower medium, and if you say low and you grow, you get yellow or green, but if you low and say flat, you're orange. So last year, both of our test scores were in the green or yellow. This year, we'll probably be in the orange, I imagine, in both scores. 
Um, there was a question at the state level, you know, will they look at an average growth? Because any one year you might have a up or a down. And so to say, oh, all of a sudden this year you're a failing district. Next year, oh, next year you're wonderful. You're a succeeding district, right? It's a little, it's a little uh, disconcerting perhaps. On the other hand, it is only one of multiple measures, right? They're also looking at the graduation rate and the dropout rate and EL performance on the CELT. Now, each of those dashboard items will be different years. So CELT will be um, two years previous, 15 and 16. Uh, cohort drop, uh, I, think, I think for the, um, not for cohort drop, but for suspension rate, I think they're hoping to try to get 15, uh, 15, 16 to 16, 17, but I'm not sure if they'll have that calculation. So every dashboard pie relates to different years of data. And so when that rolls out this spring, this uh, winter, then we'll, we'll discuss that and, and talk about, okay, yes, we're in the orange. We know our scores were flat and, you know, we know the actions we're taking um, to continue moving forward. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. We don't have any control about when they give us this information, but it seems a little mm, ludicrous. <laughs> to be getting this information in November or December? We or actually, they, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, we have yeah. this, so we know we're flat. But to get the info from the state that late in the school year? No, actually, we did have our own results in August. Okay. So we had our own results in August. We loaded into our system, and teachers were able, and principals were able to have that information on the first day of school. Okay. What we didn't have is we had, didn't have all the comparison data right. to do a board presentation with the full, full range of data. Um, anyway. and, the, and, the, and the dashboard? I mean, that's data that they're giving to us to inform our practice, I assume, and we're getting it in December? I'm sorry. I just think that's right. ludicrous. So I think, you know, they're, they're still in those initial stages of the dashboard. I think there's the idea that perhaps different parts of the dashboard might get updated as data becomes available, but this is just going to be the second release after that first, what they're considering a pilot, they're still kind of considering that spring a pilot. So um, okay. they'll do kind of a second release of all the most recent data. Um, this CASP with the suspension and data that we uploaded, I uploaded in the summer, they're gonna put all that together and try to give that kind of a, a, a new release of data. Now the question is then, as scores become available, will those different pies then, oh, now CELTA's out, or now LPAC is out, let's update that one. Oh, now CASP is out, let's update that one. That time I haven't heard if it'll be a rolling change or periods of time kind of on that accountability um, because it's also tied to a recent release so that our LCAP can address, make sure the next year's LCAP addresses this winter's dashboard. I mean, those kind of timing will be the kind of things they'll, they'll be looking at, but I can't speak to how the future rollout will be. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? It's a lot of information. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, thank Thanks you very much. much. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move into part nine, action information items regarding facilities and maintenance operations. And Jim Bombacci is here. No. Uh, item A, approval of the request for proposals, commonly known as RFP, for the design build team for the new elementary school project. And this is an action item. Yes, thank you very much. The, uh, it does show that WLC uh, is a partner. I'm sorry, I apologize, uh, Dr. Flores, uh, President Midgard and board. Sorry for missing the address. Um, the WLC is on the item. They were not available. So uh, we've seen the RFP as a draft. Uh, we've only made one change to the RFP. And that is that we pulled out the contract information. Uh, remember I told you at the last board meeting that with the contract information attached to the R RFP, we would have to actually come up with all the contract information. Uh, we don't need it until we, we actually decide who our design build team is, and that's in December. So instead of trying to hurry up with the contract information, we simply pulled it from the RFP. We'll, we'll take our time and develop a good a very good and very uh, comprehensive contract and then present that to the board separately. So that's the only difference between the two RFPs. Uh, my staff is ready to mail it out tomorrow. We have all of our envelopes ready. We have all of our people ready. Uh, council has advised us that we'll be mailing it to all of our Class B uh, contractors. I believe we have 36. 
Uh, I fully expect that uh, we'll get, be getting very few um, of those contractors uh, to bid the project because it's it's a large scope. It's it typically takes about fifty thousand dollars of their own money for preparation, <clears throat> and they also have a limited time to do it. So I expect to see. I'm hoping to see in the three to five uh, range, and then you know there's information in here how we will um, do the interview process and so on and so forth. So. Okay, questions? So the RFP is going to be sent out next week? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow. When we get in, we're, we're, we're all okay. ready. The envelopes are stamped. The email list is developed. <laughs> we are sending this out tomorrow. We want to give them every minute they can. They have about 60 days to produce a very large amount of information. We want to give them every minute that they can. Okay. So, uh, board, this is an action item. And I will entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the uh, uh, item passes unanimously. Next we have item 9B, resolution 1718-11, change order number one for premier builders for the Gilroy High School new math building phase one project. Thing. It's a credit of $104,210. Which I'm always very, very happy to present yeah. to the board a uh, credit. Uh, some, of the, some of the change order, order items that were in the, uh, in the um, process, there were only a few of them of consequence. One was uh, there was about 100 feet of, of uh, sanitary sewer pipe existing that we had to remove and replace because we're going to be built, putting a two-story sewer uh, worth of sewer back into that system, so that had to be replaced. We stubbed that out. That's actually work that would have been in project two, so uh, phase two, so that, that, that phase two money um, will be deducted from the phase two project. Uh, a few of the other ones were, that was the install the sewer line for 13,000. Um, they wanted additional data. Uh, I think the, um, the, e, uh, the IT department wanted additional data cables for the portables. Uh, we had to put protective bollards around the around the uh, the new backflow devices. Uh, we had to put, put a, a chain link fence as part of uh, some information during a uh, a walk, and uh, what color and whatnot. So we put some a fence along across the back of the building so people wouldn't run into the the uh, AC units. And you know, minor items here or there, uh, with some other credits. But the total. Yeah, the total change order uh, is a credit for 104,210, which goes back into the project. Okay. I'll entertain a motion for this. Move approval. Second. And moved and seconded. All in, oh, this is roll call. Yes. B.C. Doyle. Yes. Mark Good. Yes. Mark Good. Yes. yes. James Pace. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amy Rawson. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. The next item is Resolution 1718-12, Notice of Completion for the Gilroy High School New Math Building Phase 1 Site Work Project. Yes, this is uh, everybody's favorite. I know it's one of the board's favorites. But when, when we turn in a Notice of Completion, that means the job is done mm -hmm. and all the bills have been paid. So this is the Notice of Completion for the Gilroy High School New Math uh, Building Phase 1 Site Work Project. You'll be seeing quite a few of these coming in in the next month or so. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. This is also a roll call vote. Heather Bass. Yes. Lucy Doyle. Yes. Mark Good. Yes. Pat Lingard. Yes. James Pace. Yes. Linda Paceno. Yes. Amy Rossum. Yes. This passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bombacci. Okay. Moving ahead, uh, board member reports. Yes. I attended the uh, Gilroy High School Choir concert on Tuesday night. Heather was there, James was there, and it was uh, quite an improvement for the sound. Again, you know, not going to be ever going to be perfect because of the building, but it definitely was a big improvement over what it used to be. 
and the, all the choirs together sounded pretty good. Yes, Mr. Pace. Uh, I, meant, I went to the Gilroy High, which also included Solorzano and Brown Elk choirs, which those choirs have come a long way in the last couple of years. They sound really good now. Wow. Um, and the f last night, I went to the Christopher High and South Valley Choir concert, which was also at the Gilroy High venue. So it, it was a well attended. Sounds great in there. It's really good. Um, <clears throat> in addition, the uh, Gilroy General Plan uh, Advisory Committee met again, and we are uh, starting to talk about land uses and where we want the city or where the city is going to grow and what should go in those various places. And uh, I've been doing my best to advocate for, hey, maybe we need to allow a school to be there in case it needs. So um, I, I know they're hearing us, and uh, we're going to have staff, staff discussions at some point, I, I suspect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports? OK. Um, we have upcoming and new referral agenda items. Here's the upcoming agenda calendar. It's in our packet. It's, Just uh, as a note, one of the, the item I had for a future agenda item can be removed regarding the discussion right with the city. Right. That's what I meant to okay. cross that out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I have an item. Um, so my, my son is in computer science over at Gilroy High, and you know there's a lot of good stuff going on, which sent me to Google. And uh, I, there is, after the success of the Biomed Academy, Project Lead the Way, Project Lead the Way also has a computer science thing. And uh, we might want to look into We already doing that. have. OK. We've already had staff visit. Uh, uh, go to training. We've been talking about this for about a year. All right. And now we're at the stage where we're starting to plan in earnest. We just talked about it in cabinet on Monday. So we've already had the computer science teacher at Christopher High involved. Good. Because that's where we're thinking the program will be. Because we have the BSA at Gilway High, and Christopher's very interested in this. So we talked about it in cabinet on Monday. But um, they've already checked out the Project Lead the Way curriculum. Very cool. I see they're adding a cybersecurity, and that's like my thing. So yeah. very exciting. Yeah. The great thing about Project Lead the Way is they have the curriculum. And we don't have to create it. And there's other places that we can go visit that have it. So it's really nice. Okay. They also have middle school and elementary programs. We know, but we are focused on you know, be it starting the Bioscience Academy was a two-year hard effort. This will be, too. It's, it, and it will require allocation of funds for equipment and materials. So, you know, we're going to come with a comprehensive proposal, hopefully in the next few months, so that we can at least start on some level next year. Okay, a couple of announcements. I believe we have facilities subcommittee tomorrow morning. We do. Hi, May. Are you listening? Yes. At 9. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Okay. At 9 o'clock. And then also the FFA graciously brought over this barbecue uh, tri-tip for what, us. Was that, what was that from? They had an event. They, they, they have had, a fundraiser. They had a fundraiser. fundraiser. And so they brought... This brought it to us. us. Wow. So it's in the refrigerator in the staff room if you're interested in it. And it's wrapped it. nicely, so you could just take it home. You don't have to eat it right now. Isn't that nice? Yeah, that's no, not nice. That was very thoughtful of them. No. Um, <clears throat> the next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held on Thursday, October 19th, 2017. Uh, closed session will be at 5 and the study session at 5.30. So we're early again and open session at 7. The agenda will be available on the district's website by 5 p.m. Friday, October 13th. And with that, we beat Gina's time. Really? The meeting is adjourned. Wow.